Let's check on, please. Let me see. Oh. Can you hear me now? Recording is on now. I just turned it on. Can you hear me? Okay, great. So, and can you see the can you see the slide, the PowerPoint presentation as well? Okay, perfect. So, uh, what I was telling is like in this hour that we that we have today, we are going to talk about damages and equitable remedies. And um, in general terms, uh, like every breach of contract entitles the injured party to claim damages uh, for the loss caused by the breach. Okay, uh, what do you think is the purpose of an award of damages? Yeah, so that an injured party can get a relief. Yes, thank you, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, the purpose is to put the injured party in the position uh, this party would have been, but for the breach of contract. Uh, let's remember that in an award of damages in contract law is subject to the application of the rules uh, on causation, remoteness, and duty to, met, to mitigate loss. Okay. Um, how uh, do we measure uh, the loss of the injured party? Uh, the law has a use tradition has traditional use two measures. Uh, one protects uh, expectation interest, and the other uh, protects reliance interest. Okay, and in some cases, the injured party seeks an award uh, based uh, upon a restitutionary interest. Um, like in in like in brief, a restitutionary measure is calculated with reference to the defendant's gain rather than the claimant's loss. Okay, we are going to see a little more like uh, this this uh, uh, these measures. We are going to see it in detail like when we continue with the class. Um, uh, let's remember that uh, not all losses will be reco recoverable. Uh, okay, there are two uh, factors that limit an award of damages. Uh, one is remoteness, uh, which means that losses which are not foreseeable cannot be recover, recovered. And mitigation is a, a, a party cannot recover damages for a loss uh, that he could have reasonably avoided. Okay, that is the idea of uh, mitigation. Um, and in in general, also like a party cannot recover damages for non-financial loss, uh, such as in your feelings uh, or distress. But we are going to see that there uh, this rule is uh, some kind flexible. Okay. Um, what are we going to see in this lecture regarding damages? Let's remember we are going to do damages and equitable remedies, okay? Uh, regarding damages, we are going to talk about the purpose of an award of damages that we have uh, talked about it, you know, a little in the previous slide. A measure of damages, uh, when is restitution available? Uh, the factors that limit uh, the award of damages, such as the remoteness of damage and mitigation of damage, uh, non-financial loss, and liquidated damages. Uh, okay. The purpose of an award of damages. Um, as we said uh, before, and Sandy uh, gave us an idea, uh, the purpose of an award of damages is to compensate the injured party uh, that is the main purpose, uh, and not to punish the party in breach. Okay, um, there is a case here uh, called uh, Rusley Electronics and Construction versus Forsyth. Uh, in this case, uh, Rusley Electronics was meant to build a seven foot six uh, inch deep pool, but it was built to only six feet nine inches. 
uh, it was found that the pool was safe for diving and uh, the defendant never intended to put uh, to put in a diving ball. Uh, also, the defendant uh, had no intention to use the damages to correct the pool. Okay, and um, however, the defendant refused to pay any money uh, given the defect, and the plaintiff, uh, Rasley, sued for breach of contract. Uh, the defendant counterclaimed requesting damages to fix the pool as it should have been. Okay, uh, in this case, the trial judge gave the diminution of value was zero and the cost of cure was uh, 21,560 pounds. Um, the judge awarded 750 for inconvenience and 2,500 for loss of amenity. Uh, however, the Court of Appeal said the cost of rebuilding the pool uh, should be awarded and the House of Lords upheld an award of 2,500 pounds for loss of amenity. Um, what the, the, the House of Lords said is like, to award them nothing would be to say the promise was illusory and that was unsatisfactory. Uh, but correcting was too expensive and too much for the loss of uh, Mr. Forsyth. Uh, and it would be contrary to common sense and unreasonable. Uh, so we must look to the loss truly suffered by the promise. Okay. And also, uh, Lord Lloyd from the of, of the House of Lords said that uh, even though courts courts do not, don't care what damages will be used for, the intention of the innocent party for what he does with them may be relevant to the issue of reasonableness in awarding damages, okay? Um, so the purpose of an award of damages is not to punish the party in breach, but to compensate the injured party. Um, punitive damages are not available in English law for a breach of contract, okay? Uh, even if the defendant uh, had deliberately breached the contract, okay? Uh, also, uh, the purpose, uh, the difficulty of assessing damages will not prevent the recovery. Uh, this is illustrated in the case Chaplin versus Hicks. Uh, here, the claimant was an actress. Uh, she entered a beauty context organized by Hicks, uh, who was a famous actor and a theater manager, and advertised the contest in a newspaper. Uh, the readers of the newspaper uh, were to vote on the top 50, were to vote, and the top 50 would be invited to an interview where 12 would be selected for employment. Okay, uh, Miss Chaplin uh, get, got through to final 50 but didn't receive her invitation for interview until it was too late to attend. She brought an action based on her loss of a, of a chance of gaining employment. She was awarded 100 pounds assessed by the jury. Uh, Hicks appeared contending that the damages were speculative in nature and incapable of assessment. Uh, however, the, the court held the appeal was dismissed and the claimant was entitled to recover damages for her loss of a chance of gaining employment. She didn't have to demonstrate that she would have been successful at interview, okay? Uh, so the fact that damages cannot be assessed with certainty doesn't relieve the wrongdoer of the necessity of paying damages for his breach of contract. So we have to see this in, you know, in the context of the case, so the difficulty of assessing damages uh, will not prevent uh, the recovery. The recovery. Um, however, the claimant will not receive damages where the breach of contract has left him no worse off. 
Okay. Uh, what does it mean? We 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 can see this in to understand this. We can we can see this case. Uh, CMT whole large company versus middle phone. Okay. What happened here uh, is uh, Mr. Middleton, George Middleton, had a license to occupy premises for six months at a time, renewable. He used the premises for his car repair business. He improved the property even though the contract stated pictures were not to be removed at the end of the life. Okay. Uh, the plaintiff ejected a Mr. Middleton in breach of contract. Mr. Middleton argues he should be entitled to damages for the cost of the improvements he made. Okay. Uh, uh, one of, uh, of the judges held that Mr. Middleton's loss didn't flow from the breach of, from the breach of contract, but him going and doing the repairs when he was not meant to, because let's remember, like, you know, that was not in the contract, and also the contract said, like, the, the features were not uh, to be removed. So, no recovery of reliance loss was available, where it would allow Middleton to escape a bad bargain or reverse the contractual allocation of risk. Uh, here, the garage itself, uh, was merely an element in the defendant's business. It was not a profit-making entity on its own. Uh, so, uh, nevertheless, if as a result of being kept out of the premises, the defendant had found no other premises to go for a period of time, his claim would clearly have been a claim for such a loss of profits. Uh, but this was not the case. So. So that is when uh, uh, that's why Mr. Middleton didn't didn't uh, was not awarded a, a damage uh, because you know the claimant will not receive damages where the breach of contract has left him not worth off. Okay. Uh, also, damages are normally assessed at the time of the breach. Uh, however, this is not an inflexible rule. In the case, a uh, golden victory case, uh, it was held that in exceptional cases, damages would be reduced where it was proven that between the date of the breach and the time of the trial, certain events occur which would have inevitably reduced the damages the claimant would have recovered in respect of its loss. So, uh, this rule, like uh, damages are assessed at the time of the breach, uh, you know, has some exceptions, but we need to see uh, each each case. Uh, how do we measure damages? Okay. Uh, how is the, the claimant's loss uh, to be measured? How do we assess damages? Okay, financial or non-performance. What do you mean by financial or non-performance in there? Mm -hmm. If there is a financial loss, damages can be assessed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, like there are three possible bases for assessing damages: uh, expectation loss, reliance loss, and restitution loss. Okay. Uh, does anybody have an idea what is expectation loss?
Mm -hmm. Yes, if performance was expected and not achieved. Yeah, like, you know, when uh, when parties have a contract, uh, this contract created uh, certain expectations of performance. And uh, when when this performance is not a, is not a, is not achieved, uh, the innocent party uh, is to have these expectations fulfilled through an award of damages. Uh, an award uh, based on the claimant's expectation interest is compensation for the loss of a bargain. Uh, the claimant obtains the profits he would have received had the contract been uh, performed. Uh, damages, in this case, are assessed in reference to the claimant's expectations. Uh, in situations where the defendant doesn't perform the contract or performs it badly, the claimant is generally entitled to the cost of the cure. Uh, what is, can anybody tell me what is the cost of the cure? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sandeep. The cost insured to cure the part of the contract that is not performed. Perfect. Yes, this is the amount of money it would cost to pay someone else to complete the unfinished or defective performance, like Sandeep has said. Uh, in Watts versus Morrow, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Watts engage Morrow as a surveyor to survey a house that they were interested in buying. They made it clear that they wanted a travel-free house. However, Morrow negatively surveyed the house. Mr. and Mrs. Watts, relying on Morrow's survey, bought the house for £177,500. Later, they discovered serious defects in the house, which cost them around £34,000. At the trial of the action, the value of the house in its defective condition was established to be 162,500 pounds. The judge awarded a Mr. and Mrs. Watts 33,961 being the cost of repairs rather than 15,000 pounds being the difference between the price paid for the house and the price that would have been paid for the house had the defense been known. In addition, the judge awarded uh, Mr. and Mrs. Watts £4,000 uh, each for distress and inconvenience. Okay? Uh, the issues before the Court of Appeal uh, regarding this subject was whether damages should have been awarded for the cost of repair or whether damages should have been awarded on the difference in value between the price paid for the house and the price that would have been paid for the house had the defense been known. Okay, so here the plaintiff paid 177,500 pounds. 100, for the house, no? The value of the house in its actual condition uh, was 162,500. So there is a difference of 50,000 pounds. The actual cost of repairs was 34,000 pounds. So if the plane, if, if the, if the, the, if we follow what the trial judge has said, uh, you know, if the plaintiff were to end up with a house and an award of 34,000 damage, so 34,000 pounds damages, he would have obtained the house for 143,500. But even if the defendant had properly performed this contract, this bargain was never on offer. 
The effect of the award is not to put the plaintiff in the same position as if the defendant had properly performed, but in a much better one. Okay? So, uh, in some instances, the courts will not award the cost of the cure where this is wholly disproportionate to any, ben to any benefit which would be received. Uh, let's say where there is a little difference in value between the value of the thing contracted and the thing received. Uh, in these circumstances, a uh, court will award damages for the loss of amenity. Uh, for this, uh, for this part, please review the case uh, roughly electronics and construction case, the one that I mentioned in slide three, I think. Yes, uh, this one, roughly electronics and construction versus foresight. What is the, what is the uh, the reliance loss? What is this second measure, uh, the second this second base for assessing damages? Can anybody tell me? When the cost is totally based on the contract only. Real, uh, thank you, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, the reliance law, like this basis, is usually uh, used uh, when the claimant uh, is unable to prove that a financial benefit would accrue to it had the contract been performed. In other words, where it is difficult to quantify the position the claimant would have been in, it, would have been in, it may be possible to recover expenses in cure in reliance of the contract. To recover those expenses, a party has spent, has spent uh, because of the contract, okay? Uh, in this case, Anglia Television versus Reed, uh, the claimant, Anglia Television, engaged Oliver Reed to play the leading role in a television play. Subsequently, read a pullout and Anglia was unable to find a replacement. They abandoned to play. They abandoned the play, but had incurred expenses amounting to 2,750. 20, 2, uh, the court said, like, while damages generally seek to put the parties in the position they would have been had the contract been performed. The parties may elect to claim reliance loss and recover expenses incurred in an abortive transaction. Thus, here, Anglia Television was able to recover their expenses from the defendant. Okay? Uh, the, the, the claimant, the injured party, is the party who decides whether to seek his reliance losses or his expectation losses. Uh, the claimant cannot seek to recover his reliant losses, where this would have the effect of allowing him to escape the consequences of a bad bargain. Uh, let's remember the, the, the last case that I mentioned, uh, that is a, a CMT Holage Company versus Middleton. Okay. Uh, this case is like I mentioned before, it's about this this guy who had a license to occupy a, a space and where he made some uh, some improvements. Uh, the plaintiff Holach, you know, like ejected him because of breach of contract, and uh, Mr. Middleton, like he wanted damages because of the improvement he has made in the in the space. 
the court said, like, you know, he was, uh, he was not allowed to give damages, uh, you know, like the, the, the contract uh, what was, not, was not for this, so he was not allowed uh, to recover. Uh, these uh, these pictures that he he put in the in the in the place, okay. Uh, the other the other uh, basis for assessing damages is the restitution laws. Uh, when is restitution uh, available? What do you think? Like when 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 is this um, this measure available for the injured party? Okay, when a defendant breaches the contract. Uh, in the other cases, the defendant has also uh, breached the contract, Sandy. So can you be a little more specific? When, when do you think uh, this measure uh, will be used by the party? Recovery on a restitutionary basis will only occur when the claimant can establish that the defendant was enriched at the claimant's expense and that it is unjust to allow the defendant to retain his profit without compensating the claim. A restitutionary reward requires the defendant to disgorge the profit obtained as a result of his wrongdoing. Uh, when a contract is terminated because of the defendant's breach, the claimant may elect to proceed in contract or restitution. In this case uh, that is mentioned in the slides, Planche versus Colburn, Colburn, the claimant agreed to write a book on custom and are moored for the defendant as part of a series called the Juvenile Library. The agreed contract price was 100 pounds to be payable on completion. The claimant commenced writing and had completed a great deal of it when the defendant canceled the series. The defendant refused to pay the claimant despite his undertaking and the fact that the claimant was still willing to complete. The claimant brought an action to enforce payment. Uh, the court held that the claimant was entitled to recover 50 pounds because the defendant had prevented the performance. Uh, the circumstances in which a party can so proceed in a contract are very limited. Okay, uh, there are some. Uh, some limitations when the injured party can use a can use a restitutionary basis for recovery. Um, the first one is a total failure of consideration. Uh, the claimant may seek a restitutionary remedy where there has been a total failure of consideration. Uh, the claimant needs to establish uh, to establish this that there has been a total failure of consideration. If any part of the contract is performed, or if the claimant has received any part of the consideration, 
the restitutionary claim is barred, okay? Uh, do you remember that I mentioned when we did the illegality lecture, uh, we mentioned the case uh, Boundmakers Limited versus Barnett Instruments? Does somebody remember that case? Well, in, in this case, it was like uh, the agreement between the parties didn't comply with the statutor statutory requirements. So, you know, uh, thus it would be, uh, the contract would be illegal because of its not compliance with the statutory requirements. Uh, in this case, the defendant uh, missed payments due under the agreement and the claimant sought to recover the machines. The defendant argued that the claimant's illegality in, failure, in failing to comply with the statutory requirements barred the recovery. Uh, the claimant didn't plead the illegal agreement in making their claim. It was based on their ownership of the machine and therefore they didn't need to rely on, the, on their illegality to fund the, the claim. Um, so that is what happened here. When uh, so there was a failure of consideration by the part of the defendant. Uh, so that's why the claimant could recover the machines. You know, even though uh, the the contract was uh, illegal because of the statutory statutory requirements. Another limitation, uh, you know, is unjust benefit. Uh, the claimant seeks a restitutionary remedy on the ground that the defendant has obtained an unjust benefit or profit because of his breach of contract. Uh, the House of Lords has uh, now held that the court would order an account of profits where neither equitable remedies nor an award of damages would not provide a sufficient remedy. Okay, what is this account of profit? In the case Attorney General versus Blake, uh, George Blake was a former member of the Secret Intelligence Service uh, from 1944 to 1961. Uh, for his employment, contract, uh, he had signed an official secret act uh, of 1911, from 1911, declaration to disclose no information about his work. It applied after his employment season. In 1951, he became a Soviet agent, thus being a double agent. He was discovered in 1961, uh, and the British government imprisoned him. He escaped in 1966 and fled to the Soviet Union. Uh, he wrote a book about it and his secret services work called No Other Choice. He received a publishing contract for its release in 1989. The information in the book was no longer confidential. Blake received advance payments and was entitled to more. The Crown brought an action for all the profits he made on the book, including those that he had not yet received. It argued a restitutionary principle should apply. The court held that in exceptional cases, when the normal remedy is inadequate to compensate for breach of contract, the court can order the defendant to account for all profits. This was an exceptional case. Uh, Blake had harmed the public interest publication was further breach of his undertaking of confidentiality and disclosure of non-confidential information was also a criminal offense. Uh, an absolute rule against disclosure was necessary to ensure that the Secret Service was able to deal in complete confidence. So it was 
in the Crown's legitimate interest to ensure Blake didn't benefit from revealing state information. Uh, the normal contractual remedies of damages, specific performance or injunction were not enough, and the publisher should pay any money owing to Blake to the Crown. Okay. Uh, this account of profits required the wrongdoer to disgorge the benefit he obtained by the breach of contract. Okay. We have said that there are some uh, limitations, uh, like some factors that limit the the recovery of damages. Uh, one of these one is the remoteness of damage. Uh, what is remoteness of damage? What do you understand by remoteness? Distance of damage from what should have been in contract. Yes, thank you, Sandeep. When the loss of the injured party is held to be too remote, uh, the injured party cannot recover for his loss, even if he has established that his loss was caused by the defendant's breach. Uh, a claimant may only recover losses which may reasonably be considered as arising naturally from the breach or those which may reasonably be supposed to be in the contemplation of the parties at the time the contract was made, okay? So this is very important, like a claimant may only recover losses which may reasonably be considered as arising naturally from the breach or those which may reasonably be supposed to be in the contemplation of the parties at the time the contract was made. Uh, in the case Hadley versus Baxendale, uh, the crankshaft broke in the claimant's mill, okay? And he engaged the services of the defendant to deliver the crankshaft to the place where it was to be repaired and to subsequently return it after it had been repaired. Due to neglect of the defendant, the crankshaft was returned seven days late. The claimant was unable to use the mill during this time and claimed for loss of profit. The defendant argued that he was unaware that the mill would have, be, would have to be closed during the delay and therefore the loss of profit was too remote. So what was the holding? The damages available for breach of contract include those which may, which may fairly and reasonable be considered arising naturally from the breach of contract, it has to be foreseeable, or such a damages as may reasonable be supposed to have been in the contemplation of the parties at the time the contract was made. Uh, if any special circumstances exist which were actually communicated to the defendant, the claimant may recover any damage which would ordinarily follow from a breach of contract under special circumstances communicated. So in this case, the claimant couldn't, uh, couldn't get, you know, the damages for loss of profits because this loss was not foreseeable and uh, the defendant didn't know that the meal was going, uh, was going to stop for the amount of, uh, for those days that the crankshaft was, uh, was not sent. So, because he was, the, the loss was not foreseeable, the, defend, the claimant couldn't, uh, couldn't get the damages and, uh, and also like, it was never mentioned to the defendant that it was very important to have that piece on time uh, for the meals operation. Okay? The other factor that limits 
the recovery of damages is mitigation of damage. Um, the claimant is not permitted to allow their losses to mount up. They, uh, the claimant is under a duty to take reasonable steps to reduce his loss. So another factor which can add to limit the damage of the claimant is the duty to mitigate. There are two elements to this duty, to avoid increasing loss and to add reasonable to reduce it. In this case that is, in the, uh, that is mentioned in the slide, uh, what happened here is a uh, A British, the a British Westinghouse Electric uh, supplied underground electric with turbines, which in breach of contract were deficient in power. Okay, underground electric accepted and used the turbines, but reserved the right to claim damages. Later, they replaced the turbines with others, which were far more efficient than those supplied by the defendants would have been even if they had complied with the content. Underground Electric claimed to recover the cost of the substitute turbines as damages. The House of Lords held that in assessing the damages for the breach, any loss sustained by underground had to be balanced against any gain to them arising directly out of the steps they have taken to lessen the consequences of the breach. Although underground had not been bound to buy the new machine, having done so, the consequential gain in profits and safe expenses had to be brought into account. The savings exceeded the cost of the machine as, and so underground recovered nothing under uh, this, this head. Okay, uh, so here we can see that underground decided uh, when, when, when the other party uh, deliver the defective servants, underground decided to buy more expensive servants. And they uh, they wanted to recover uh, you know uh, the 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 loss that they have incurred uh, because of uh, buying these expensive servants. But the court said uh, no, you know, you cannot recover on this uh, because you 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 should have take a uh, reasonable steps or add reasonable uh, to reduce your damages or to avoid increasing loss. Uh, sometimes the duty to mitigate uh, will require the injured party to recontract uh, with the party in breach on a slightly different terms. In this case, uh, Peizu versus Sounders, uh, by the terms of the contract, the defendant was to deliver goods to the claimant on a monthly basis, and the claimant was to pay for the goods within one month of delivery. The contract was to run for nine months. The claimant received the goods at a discounted price because he had committed to purchase from the supplier over the nine month period. The claimant was late in making the first installment. The defendant refused to continue with the original contract, but told the claimant that he would deliver the goods in future if the claimant paid cash on delivery and would still let him have the goods at the discounted price. The claimant rejected this offer and purchased the goods elsewhere at a higher price. He then sued the defendant, claiming the difference between the contractually agreed price and what he actually paid for them. The court says that the claimant was not entitled to damages. He was given the opportunity to purchase at the discounted price, but rejected this. He was under a duty to take reasonable steps to mitigate his loss. The offer was reasonable one, and one which the claimant could easily have complied with. Okay? Non-financial loss. Do you think that non-financial laws are recoverable?
Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, th there, are, there are some exceptions. We are going to secure like uh, a non-financial uh, losses is loss caused by anxiety, mental distress, and hard feelings. Uh, at first, injured feelings were not compensable for a breach of contract. In this case, Addis versus Ransom, the claimant was employed as a manager by the defendant. The defendant in breach of contract dispensed with his services and replaced him with a new manager. The claimant, Addis, brought an action for breach of contract, claiming that the level of damages should reflect the circumstances in which he was dismissed. Uh, damage his reputation and ability to find suitable employment. Contract, what, what the court said was that the contract law seeks to put the parties in the position they would have been had the contract been performed. He was therefore limited to claiming wages and loss of commissions during the contractually agreed notice period. There was no right to exemplary damages or damage to reputation in contract claims. Um, so here the plaintiff was not allowed to recover damages to cover the indignity he suffered because of the manner in which he was dismissed uh, by the defendant. Okay. Uh, however, this uh, rule was subject uh, to exceptions. Primarily, uh, these occurred non-financial losses, you know, like that non-financial losses are, rec are not recoverable. This rule was subject to exception. Uh, primarily, this occurred where the purpose of the contract uh, was to provide pleasure. Uh, in this case, Jackson versus Horizon Holidays, uh, what happened was that Mr. Jackson booked a 20-day holiday in Ceylon for himself and his family through Horizon Holidays. The hotel turned out to be unsatisfactory for various reasons relating to cleanliness and provision of services. Uh, the trial judge, judge made an award for the disappointment suffered by Mr. Jackson, but stated he could not take into account the disappointment suffered by his wife and children, since they were not party to the contract. Um, Mr. Jackson appealed, and uh, the court held that Mr. Jackson was able to recover for the disappointment suffered by his wife and children. Uh, damages to reflect discomfort and disappointment can only be claimed where enjoyment was part of the bargain of the contract. Uh, for example, holidays or a meal out or entertainment. This most commonly seen in holidays which fail to meet the standard the holiday maker was led to believe would be enjoyed. Okay? Uh, there is an interesting case. Uh, it is called Malik versus VCCI. Uh, here, Mr. Malik and Mr. Mahmoud both worked for the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, VCCI. VCCI went insolvent due to massive fraud, connection with terrorists, money laundering, extortion, uh, and other uh, criminal activity on a global scale. Uh, Malik and Mahmoud uh, had both lost their jobs and they sought employment elsewhere. They couldn't find jobs. They sued the, com they sued the, co sued the company for their loss of job prospects, alleging that their failure to secure new jobs was due to the reputational damage they had suffered from working with BCCI. Nobody, they said, wanted to hire free po people from a massive fraud operation like that at the company. This case raised the question of what duty the company had always to see to its employees that had been broken. Although argued there was an implied term in their employment contract that nothing would be done calculated to undermine mutual trust and confidence. The House of Lords unanimously held that the term of mutual trust and confidence would be implied into the contract as necessary incident of the employment relation. Uh, such implied terms operate as default rules. The parties are free to exclude or modify them, but it's common ground that in the present case, the particular terms of the contracts of employment of the two applicants could not affect an implied obligation of mutual trust and confidence. So, 
so here the motives of employer cannot be determinative or even relevant in judging the employee's claim for damages for breach of the implied obligation. If conduct objectively considered consider is likely to cause serious damage to the relationship between employer and employee, a breach of the implied obligation may arise. Okay? So, uh, damages for not pecuniary losses would be allowed for a breach of contract where an important object to the contract was to give pressure or peace of mind. Uh, so here it's important to see the case and see what is the object uh, in the contract. If the, the goal of the contract, the object of the contract is to give pleasure uh, and if this is not fulfilled, then damages for non-pecuniary losses would be allowed for breach of contract. Uh, please read this case, Farley versus Skinner, uh, to understand this a little more. Uh, we are running out of time and I want to, to to finish with equitable remedies as well. So I invite you to read this case, Farley versus Skinner, uh, to understand this uh, this concept. Let's go to the to the other uh, slide. Liqu liquidated damages. Uh, it is very convenient for the for the claimant if the contract can state a sum which will be payable by the defendant in the event of breach and the claimant can then sue for the stated sum. A liquidated damages clause is enforceable provided that the amount is a genuine pre-estimate of the damage and not unconscionable. Uh, parties to a contract may uh, legitimately agree the amount of damages to be paid in the event of a breach and provide for this in their contract terms. This provides certainty to each party so that they know exactly what they are liable to pay should they be unable to perform their obligations. Uh, such a clause will be enforceable by the court only in so far as it is a genuine pre-estimate of loss. Uh, if it is a genuine pre-estimate, it is known as a liquidated damage clause. If, however, the amount specified in the contract is not a genuine pre-estimated, but is aimed at deterring a breach of contract or punishing the party in breach, this is known as a penalty clause, which is not enforceable, okay? Equitable remedies. Damages as we have seen, is the usual remedy awarded to the injured party in a case of breach of contract. The remedies in equity seek uh, the performance of the contract rather than damages to rectify the breach of contract. Uh, these remedies that we are going to see here are specific performance and injunction. An order for a specific performance of a contract is an exceptional, an exceptional remedy. Uh, this order is made when damages are an, inade are an, an inadequate remedy. If the claimant could adequately be compensated by an award of damages for the breach of contract, the courts are unlikely to order a specific performance. In this case, Cohen versus Roche, the claimant owned a furniture shop and entered an agreement to purchase a quantity of a kind of chairs to sell in his shop. The defendant in breach of contract refused to deliver the chairs. The claimant sued for breach of contract and sought a specific performance for the delivery of the chairs. The court refused to grant a specific performance. Uh, the claimant would be adequately compensated by an award of damages. The chairs were considered ordinary articles of commerce and of no special value of interest. 
the claimant could have purchased the shares elsewhere. So in this case, you know, like a specific performance was not awarded because uh, an award of damages <coughs> uh, could have been given. Uh, however, damages for breach of a contract to sell land are viewed as inadequate, and the usual remedy in such a case is an order for a specific performance. So when there is a breach of contract to sell land, uh, generally, you know, an order for a specific performance would be, would be issued. Also, when it may be extremely difficult or impos impossible to quantify the claimant's loss, and a specific performance will be awarded. In addition, courts have considered whether or not the defendant would be able to pay an award of damages. If it seems unlikely, unlikely an order for a specific performance may be made. So uh, in each case, the court will, will, will have to see you know, if the defendant uh, is able or not to pay an award of damages. If he or she is not able, then a specific, an order for a specific performance may be made. Uh, on the other hand, there are some factors that prevent an order for a specific performance. Uh, so, so there are some restrictions that apply. Uh, the first one is Uh, the claimant conduct must be beyond question. This rests upon the equitable maxim that he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. Um, if the claimant has performed the contract in an unfair manner, the order will be refused. If the order will result in severe hardship to the defendant, then a court will not make an order for a specific performance. When it is impossible for the defendant to comply with the order, then the court will not order it. Uh, this is the case, for instance, when the defendant has contracted to sell a land that he doesn't own. You know, so that, that is impossible for the defendant to comply with the specific performance. Uh, there must be a mutuality of remedy. Uh, the court will refuse to order a specific performance of a contract uh, at the request of one party if it could not order it at the request of the other party, okay? Um, and also, uh, courts will not make an order for a specific performance with regard to contracts for personal services or employment. And also, a contract which require the constant supervision of the court are unlikely to be the subject of an order for a specific performance. Damages in lieu of a specific performance. The court has the power to award damages in addition to or in substitution for a specific performance. Uh, it cannot make such an award where the ability to seek the specific relief has been lost. Okay. Uh, in this case, Roth versus Tyler, uh, the plaintiff agrees to purchase the defendant's house. Then the defendant's wife registered a title that was binding on subsequent purchases. The plaintiff sued for a specific performance and damages, while the value of the house rose drastically between the time of agreement and trial. Here, it was said that damages are made in substitution of a specific performance and must constitute a true substitute for a specific performance. The damages awarded must provide as nearly as possible what a specific performance of the contract would have provided. Okay, so here in this case, a specific performance uh, could not happen, so an award of damages was given. And as the court uh, mentioned, the damages awarded must provide as nearly as possible what a specific performance of the contract would have provided. And lastly, the, the, this equitable remedy injunction. Uh, injunctions uh, are another form of an equitable remedy available only at the discretion of the judge. The court will not order injunction where it would cause such a particular hardship to a defendant. Uh, there is an 
overlap between mandatory injections and specific performance, which has been recognized uh, by the court. The court will not grant an injection in circumstances that would, in effect, be an order for a specific performance where it would not generally be allowed. In this case, page one records versus Britain, the claimant record the claimant record company owned by Larry Page was the manager of the pop group, the trucks. By contrast, the trucks agree that Page One Records would be their manager and sole an agent for five years in return for 20% of the profits. By a term of the contract, the trucks agree not to appoint anyone else for the duration. However, the relationship with Larry Page broke down and the trucks wrote a letter to the claimant seeking to terminate the contract. The claimant sought an injunction to prevent the trucks appointing a new manager. The court held that the injunction was refused. To grant an injunction would be akin to ordering a specific performance of a contract for personal services, since the effect of the injunction would be to compel the truck to continue to employ the claimant or not work at all. Okay? And uh, there is one last case regarding relating to injunction. It is uh, the Warner Bros. versus Nelson. Uh, by contract, the defendant actress, uh, Betty Davis, agreed to act exclusively uh, for Warner Bros. for two years. The contract stipulated not only that could she not ask for another, but also she could take no employment at any time. Betty Davis then moved to England and in breach of contract, entered an agreement to act for another. Warner Bros. Son, uh, sought an injunction to prevent her from doing so. Uh, here, the injunction was granted, but only insofar as it prevented Betty Davis from acting or performing for another. The term relating to no employment of any kind was severed and didn't form part of the injunction. Okay? So, these are the, uh, you know, we have seen here uh, damages, uh, uh, how damages are measured. Uh, let's remember damages are measured by expectation loss, uh, reliance loss, and also there is a, the restitutionary basis that the injured party can use as well. But this is very limited. Uh, and also if an, an award of damages cannot be issued, then under a under the equitable remedies and a specific performance uh, can be made and also injunctions can be can be made. Okay? Uh, this is the class for today. This is going to be our our last class uh, and it's kind of you know I know that it was kind of dense uh, but I wanted to 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 talk about uh, these two subjects in this lecture. And, uh, you know, I wish you all the best luck in, in your exams. And, uh, and that's it. Have a good weekend, guys. Bye. Thank you.